Hey everyone, it's Seamus. Just letting you know, might hear a slight echo for some of the episode. We're still young and learning the podcasting game, so we apologize for that. Anyways, on with the episode. Hello and welcome to On the Same Page, a podcast in which two mates separated by oceans and hemispheres talk about books and catch each other up on life between the lines. Unfortunately, we can't get together in person, but through this podcast, we hope to get on the same page. Hey, welcome back to another episode of On The Same Page. As always, I am your host, Seamus, and with me, as always, is Blake. Blake, how are you? I'm not too bad, thanks, mate. It's a quite tranquil Sunday morning here in Berlin. Mm. Not much going on, not much commotion. Trees remain naked and... uh, Stark. Yeah, it's actually kind of eerily quiet. Um, That's nice. I don't. I don't know if I've missed something. Maybe uh, the everyone plague had a big has night finally last night. killed everyone. Oh, <laughs> yes, because today we Maybe. are doing our first deep dive of a book. Today's yes, episode will be about we've gone with the plague. The plague. <laughs> Albert Camus' The Plague. Yeah. So it should be fun. The whole episode will be on the plague, minus the inner shelf and what we're reading, of course. But I'm excited for today. Yeah. And like, you know, we're trying to get on the same page about everything. So we like to talk about one thing, talk about everything. So, you know, if you're not in the mood to listen to About the Plague for a whole episode, um, shut up and just enjoy it because (laughs) maybe you'll, maybe you'll like it. You don't even know. Um, Speaking (laughs) of people who like it, we have received a letter and by letter, I mean someone uh, from... Uh, well, an old friend, mm-hmm. uh, Brazil via Holland, this letter comes from. Nice. Uh, let me just read it out a bit. I didn't want to send an email. This, uh, this comes from Amanda. I didn't want to send an email because I don't have anything smart to say, but still, I want to say I'm really enjoying the podcast. I didn't used to be into podcasts because I simply can't concentrate for too long without visuals. But somehow you and Seamus always get me listening to the whole episode. Also, you two bring me some good laughs when I need it. Embarrassing when I'm on the bus. Or even some weird comfort when you read your depressing quotes or poems. (laughs) I (laughs) I am enjoying to learn about books I want to read. The ones I've never heard of or to get uh, or to get the excitement of, oh, I know this one. Let's do this. So I guess I should say thank you. And I hope you you two keep doing this for a long time. (laughs) So thank you, Amanda. That thank was you so uh, much, Amanda. That's so lovely. Yeah, that really, as as I told Amanda, that really put a smile on my dial in a yeah. uh, tough, dreary week. Nice to yeah. know that. Um, I don't know. Someone is out there listening in this abstract, absurd, and not just in, speaking in to existence. a screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but. Yeah, so that's nice to hear, and yeah, that's lovely. nice to Thank hear that so people much, are man. enjoying it. Mm. I hope you know, give us some feedback. What do you think? Do you guys like the style of podcast we were doing with the kind of talking about themes or concepts, or if you like these more deep dive ones, let us know. Um, in the meantime, mm. Seamus, what's your inner shelf for this week? Well, my inner shelf is along the same line, and last night I had my ten year high school reunion. Um, Gross. Which is, yeah, I know. <laughs> it was a shock to the system when I got that invite. Um, wow. Yeah. And uh, I turned up to this event. It was, it, it actually was kind of fun to see some of these people that I haven't seen in, in 10 years. And um, so many, or well, not so many of them, but quite a few of them who I hadn't seen were like, oh, like, I'm, I'm trying to listen to your podcast. How, like, I'm enjoying the <laughs> podcast. And I was like, I haven't seen you in 10 years. Wow. How, how have you found it? What's going on? We don't follow each other on Instagram. Yeah. We're not friends on Facebook. What's going on? And just like friends of friends of friends of friends, they've seen someone like it on this and it comes up in their feed. And so they've started listening and it, it, it was a bit of an odd feeling, but it was kind of fun to know that it's out there and getting around and people that, I mean, these both these people, they're, they're Tom and Eddie, 
that I was talking to specifically about it, they said they're not huge readers themselves, but they're giving it a go and seeing what happens, which is which is lovely to hear. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, guys. That's my inner shelf, 10-year high school reunion. That's about it. Yeah. Marvellous. Well, I mean, yeah, if I... Uh, if I went to my 10 year high school reunion, which I never would, <laughs> that sounds like a, I don't know, a fate worse than death to me. Yeah. But uh, if I did and people were complimentary, well, I think it would make, <laughs> it would make things make much nicer. More fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's lovely to hear. And yeah, it's really nice to have, to be able to do this podcast and yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. So it's nice to hear that people are actually listening. Although I'd probably do it even if they weren't, <laughs> no, well, yeah. which I guess is a good sign. Yeah, we're not in it for the money because mm-hmm. there's no money for the money. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but, did you have an inner shelf moment this week? Yes. Well, when it comes to good signs, this might be the opposite, and I, mm. it, it's, a, it's a good way to start in on the plague. I was, I had, I've read The Plague before, uh, and mm. I definitely resisted rereading The Plague. I think a lot of people came to The Plague, uh, obviously, during COVID-19 pandemic. Mm-hmm. Very apposite uh, book to read now, and as we're going to discuss today, it has a lot to talk about for mm-hmm. the experience yeah. of isolation and exile and separation and all this, uh, you know, abstract threats and things like that. But... Um, I think uh, it was interesting giving it a... Uh, I, li- I listened to it for a second time. And the other night I was out just kind of walking around on the kind of cold, tense streets of Berlin. Mm. And uh, as I was kind of walking, a rat bounced across oh. the path in front of me. And I thought, plague! <laughs> Here it is. Uh, and oh. rats aren't as big a thing in, in uh, a massive thing in Berlin. You see some kind of like field mice around sometimes, but it's not like mm. in New York where rats are kind of quite commonplace. Um, so I was like, ah, big, juicy, healthy rat bounding across the path. Nice. Under, yeah, un- that? You know, diving into a, between a fence into some hedge. Um, you know, in Berlin, there's a lot of, you know, you, you see undernourished foxes mm. and in the kind of west, you know, uh, suburban west part of the city there is wild pigs hmm. um which apparently kind of a mate of mine used to um you know beg for to be let to stay at people's houses so he didn't have to go back to his apartment late at night because the pigs apparently attack you like mother pigs <laughs> <laughs> with they got tusks you know like full boars <laughs> yeah. like chase people boars and are stuff scary. yeah yeah, and you got to do that like Mick Dundee thing where you like go Meh, with your fingers <laughs> and, and try and put it to sleep. I don't know if I have Paul Hogan's. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not that Australian. <laughs> but um, don't take that as actual advice, listeners. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. And then the foxes and the Irish foxes you see a bit as well, scrounging mm-hmm. around. And I feel sorry for them. I feel it's a kind of irony of lefty Berlin. I think recycles too well that the foxes aren't eating mm. as well yeah. as they might be because everyone's <laughs> there's not everyone's as much garbage. Too good a job. Yeah. Yeah. So good. the poor foxes are just desperate and they're they're doing all sorts of things to mm. to find the the I don't know to scavenge a bit of food. But anyway, I thought that was a good place to start because you know the beginning of uh, the the novel. You know there is a dead rat in the yes. hallway as. Ryu, our kind of main protagonist, the doctor in Iran, uh, steps on. And this is the kind of first portent or omen of what is about to come. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I thought I'd throw this open. So now let's jump into the plague. Um, yeah. Well, should we talk like about first what the novel's about? Yeah, true. Yep. So I had sort of, I, I wrote down my my little 50 word paragraph of of my sort of response to it I, I i i'm i'm interested to hear yours actually because you read it years ago before covid was a thing and you've since reread it so i'm i'm excited for this episode and to get your opinions and thoughts on it but this is my little sort of opening tidbit the plague is an exploration exploration of the world's response to something that lies out of their control Throughout this novel, they fight against a plague brought on by rats, struggling to understand and act accordingly, and all the while I read it, I couldn't help but think, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So that's my little, that was just my quick little 
response or what I could remember and my reaction to it while reading it because I read it ooh, last year, so peak peak pandemic. Maybe it was the year before actually because this pandemic has been going on quite a while at this stage. Um, but yes, I, I read it during COVID. So yeah, I'd be interested. I obviously now you've read it, reread it. Did well? Did you have an opening paragraph that you wanted to read? Well, or I thought. I mean, there's thought? there's. It's a real, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's quite a masterpiece uh, and it is particularly from a list, you know, a literary perspective, it's, it's so well done from a layering point of view because there's so many layers to, to the plague um, that Camus really expertly uh, kind of textures in. And the first time I, I read it, you know, very much, I was a, you know, a very, and still am a very, um, just very interested in Camus and his philosophy and his writing. Kind mm. of read everything. He's he's real. Uh, you know, when it comes to kind of my pantheon of um, the kind of writers and and thinkers that I'm drawn to, you know, Camus in you know the the, the top kind of five because all of my uh, kind of heroes are all sensualists, all Baldwin's mm-hmm. and Oscar Wilde, and and Camus yeah. very much a sensualist, and that comes in. Um, strongly in all of his philosophy and his philosophy is richly entwined in the plague because sensualism is a kind of imperialism. It bases its experience of the world off the senses and off perception and against abstraction, against abstract thought. Sensualism wants something palpable. It wants something, you know, uh, palpable to the senses. Mm -hmm. And Camus' kind of big argument or big, analogy of the plague i mean the first layer is of course that it's occupied france you know he's yes the plague is nazism the plague is the germans in paris the plague is that is vichy france and this is you know yeah all all it was the the jews were called a pestilence and they had to be exterminated and of course it's called the plague so yeah and that's it that that's where abstraction comes from this is kind of camus big uh, you know, the uh, disagreement with Sartre in the later years came because obviously Sartre is such an abstractionist <laughs> and your, Camus your is so best opposed. Mate. Yeah, I mean, for this reason, because I decide so strongly with Camus on this, mm. is that, you know, you can only have uh, you can only have the gulag and you can only have the Holocaust with abstraction, with decades and decades of decades of not engaging with Jews, of engaging with calling them rats, calling them vermin. You know, until you get to the point where the idea of this group of people has become abstracted and therefore you can murder mm. them. Mm. That's where that's how murder is constructed in, in Camus' idea. You know, you can see this in The Stranger, how abstraction allows you to, you know, if you abstract yourself from society and you get, you know, you can, mm. you can mm. capable of killing. You also see this in one of Camus' very uh, big concerns throughout his life, which was capital punishment. And then in, in the character of uh, Teru being, you know, had his father... Uh, well, actually, before we get into all this, we should probably say <laughs> the plague is set in Iran. Uh, yes. You know, uh, Algeria's second city. An Algeria coastal town. Around the Mediterranean, across the coast, across the Mediterranean from Spain. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have... An amazing scenery which Camus layers. Of course, you know, a lot of Camus' fictional work is set and, and his essays are set in Algeria and in North Africa. Mm. Um, mm. And so you have, you know, a, a main core of characters, all various aspects of Camus himself and aspects of people reacting to this uh, pestilence, this, you know, um, seclusion. Iran is cut off from the rest of the world because plague breaks out. No one's allowed in or out. Only te- only telegrams. So it's as if you know you can only communicate with the world via Twitter posts because yeah. physical letters and stuff is also not allowed because they're not sure if that carries the plague. Mm. Um, and you have a cast of characters. You have uh, Ryu, who is a doctor. You have uh, Rambert, who is a journalist who is kind of trapped in Iran, chasing a story, and he wants to get back to his girlfriend his in, in Paris. Paris, yeah, you know, wife in Paris. There's Teru, oh, who's no. this kind of wanderer um who has embodies this kind of person who wants to somehow become a saint in a mm. re- a religious existence mm. um and you have 
grand this character Joseph or grand, grand this character who uh you know he's another great abstraction that uh we can talk about some people when confronted with this kind of event um it really spurs them into productivity mm. my experience of COVID 19 has been like the most productive writing period of my life grand oh, yeah. can't seem to get past the first sentence he's just mm. trying to construct this first sentence of this like mm woman riding a horse in the Bois de Boulogne or somewhere and some flowers strewn somewhere or no, they're not strewn because that would mean they're not growing. And, you know, and he's just yeah. got hundreds yeah. of different versions of this one line <laughs> and he can't seem to move past it. So there's all sorts of characters. Um, and of course, one of Camus uh, criticism of Camus, you know, there's a, there's a lack of Arab characters in his fiction, mm. which I don't really need to get into, but that's basically what happens. The novel is set as plague breaks out and then you have you know these characters dealing with it um and the various layers of uh, Camus philosophy of the absurd and his uh, ideas about abstraction the dangers of abstraction and of course the plague is itself an abstract threat you know so you have the people who just have the common decency like Ryu to get on with their work mm. despite all the pressures That'll his wife awful. is in a kind of sanatorium outside town and he can't see her yeah. she's sick um and you have you know the people who are uh, just trying to get out you know they're, they're trying to live their individual lives like rambert mm -hmm. he's like you know this i don't belong here there's a scene where he talks to ram to uh the doctor ryu and he's like i don't belong here you know i need to get out and he's trying to find kind of surreptitious ways to to smuggle himself out of the town and Ryu says, well, you belong here now because this is just where you are <laughs> i mean yeah, you can't yeah. and you just got to get on there's a great Auden line where he says, you know, people just need to get on with what they're good at. And, mm. you know, un under this kind of pressure, you just kind of reduce to, you know, doing the commonly decent thing, even if it, I think, uh, has little effect. And this is a big thing for Camus. You know, he's, uh, we, you talked about the stranger in another episode um, and the kind of, his philosophy of the absurd, which we can, we can talk about a bit more. He builds in the stranger and in the plague. And then after the plague, he publishes this book called The Rebel, which is a long mm. essay. It's kind of against Marxist philosophy in a way. And it's, um, you know, against abstraction. And he's kind of, you know, if the diagnosis of the problem, existential problem is the absurd, then the cure or the solution and the treatment is to rebel, to rebel against um, the absurdity of existence by, by loving, by giving yep. meaning, yep. by all these things. And... Um, and I think uh, he has this idea, you know, he changes the Descartian cogito, like I think, therefore I am, mm. to I rebel, therefore we are. And so he has this idea, you know, yeah. all these characters, yeah. they're all just kind of provincial. There's a provincial doctor, it's a provincial town, a kind of minor journalist. You have these other people who are a bit lost. None of them really amount to anything great. But mm. once they all get together, i.e., you know, none of these people in the French resistance, which is what it's, an, it's a kind of analogy for, uh, um, you know, are by themselves enough to dent the Nazi machine. But if they all cooperate together in the underground, mm. then they can have an impact. And yep. all these yep. people can't defeat this abstract idea of the plague, just like all by ourselves doing our own things, not giving a fuck, can't defeat COVID. But if we all act together, take vaccines, uh, you know, live by health requirements for a period, make small sacrifices. Mm. And as Ryu puts it, you know, having just common decency, then you can have an impact. And I think Camus, despite his, you know, great individualism as uh, a philosopher, um, actually always prizes collective action. You know, he was a big theater guy and he was a big sportsman and he, he, he liked the idea of individuals participating in a team to make a difference. Mm. Um, I think that's why I like the theater so much. He was a great, goalkeeper he was a goalkeeper for the university of algiers um i think he probably would have been an outfield player but he had tuberculosis so he probably couldn't do much but you know i think he liked that idea of collective action yeah, through yeah. in an individual sense of rebellion an individual confrontation with the absurd um and yeah so you've got all these characters working together uh through the book which i think is uh you know another really interesting part of it um and then you've got characters like Father um, Father <clears throat> Penelou, who who who's yeah. a religious character, then basically saying this is descended upon us because we're all sinners. 
we all need to repent. And then there's actually a rise in in religion in the town because people are thinking, shit, mm-hmm. we we don't understand what's going on. Maybe we do need religion, and he sort of takes advantage of it in a way to to bring more people into his his religious sect, mm. which is is a very stark contrast to Dr. Ryu who's trying to actually solve an issue here not just get followers and, and get someone to pray for you and with you and for what you believe in so mm. I liked I I liked him as a character because he was a fun a fun little contrast but I just wanted to ask because I feel like if you read this book now in a pandemic you basically completely gloss over the fact that it's 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 about the Nazi occupation and, and banding together and as you said denting the machine when you read it the first time was it more about the allegory of the Nazis or was it more about the pandemic and a plague because what year did you read this book originally uh, I don't remember I would say maybe like five or six years ago yeah I'm yeah. not sure exactly i had um you know a a big camu phase i read Mm. i don't know almost a lot of it um (laughs) the novels the the essays the the plays and um and some of the you know the journalism the correspondence in the you know the letters so many things i kind of just yeah became obsessed with the idea so i think what i was most reading the plague for was in the mindset of camus philosophy i think that's what i was most interested in at the time Mm. and therefore at the time i kind of got this i'm just a great lover of philosophical novelists i love dostoevsky i love baldwin i love lawrence you know i love these people who who you know if they're if they're good writers they can smuggle their philosophy into a good plot into a good story Mm -hmm. Mm. and if they're great writers then they can make uh the philosophy and the story kind of blend together perfectly um actually this is i think you know and that that really gets to the heart of what i think camus thought uh, that art and life was he kind of believed in blending them a lot and yeah, so you know, I was like, okay, this is an allegory for the for the French occupation. That's obvious, and I you know was kind of into the history of what Camus did in the he, you know he was the editor of of, of Combat, which was an underground um, newspaper for the French Resistance, and you know he was writing like five or six pieces a week for this thing. You know, he was like working hard. Another reason I don't like Sartre is that Sartre didn't basically went to one resistance meeting and then basically said that he was part of the resistance for the rest of Mm. his life and didn't risk his life as everyone else did and unfortunately there was too many people in the resistance who did get killed uh that couldn't disagree with him (laughs) and so no one was able to tell him that he was a liar apart from Camus um and uh so you know I, I had that going on but the plague was just a kind of oh this is a great device this is just a great literary device to get these points across to demonstrate Mm, mm. an abstract threat to show how abstraction um can uh can hold a society hostage Mm. can uh you know do all these things so then the second reading i think what i was interested in the second reading i i was i guess most struck by was just how well he was able to do it that you can Mm. read the plague as just a good novel about the plague about yeah. the kind of pestilence 100 you could read yeah. it without the allegory you could read it not knowing anything about history you could read it not knowing much about Camus' philosophy and just learning about it through the characters because i think the characters are so um you know well uh well provided um and come across with such uh i don't know delicacy and um that yeah you can read it in so many ways and you can read it in all ways at once, all mm. layers at once, which I think I really liked. And there was a famous um, Roland Barthes, I think, in a French literary theorist, I think I've talked about before, he uh, published a criticism of the plague saying that uh, he thought it was um, not 
a great representation or a great analogy for the French resistance because it didn't quite uh, cover the kind of heroism and the despair and the sacrifices made, you know, on that vi- level of violence and level of confrontation mm. with mm. an enemy that having an abstract idea of a plague didn't really show how terrifying being part of the French resistance was kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and Camus wrote a reply and in which he kind of more or less said, like, Roland, I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, I, I wasn't trying to do this exactly. And he also said something which I, I've quoted in essays uh, in an academic context, you know, because, I, I, you know, I generally have a, I'm not a reader or a writer who likes too much realism. You know, realism's good. You don't want it to be, you know, completely abstract. You know, you want some realism. You want to be able to tell forms and things like that. Mm, you know, it mm, doesn't mm. have to be abstract expressionism. Um, but, you know, to go naturalism, to go to just like, if if to, to make it as if, it's much easier to talk about this in terms of painting. If you were going to, once you get, if the painting's basically a photograph, just take a photograph. Yeah. Because you're you're distorting two art forms now. You're getting lost in between. You can either find yeah, yeah. poetry in the way someone takes a photograph, or you can in, insert your own emotional realism and your experience and your uh, feeling in the way you paint. But if you try and do both, then you just kind of get lost. Yeah. And that he says to Bart, um, uh, many of your remarks are clarified by the very simple fact that I do not believe in realism in art. Uh, mm. which he says in just a parenthesis, like in, in some brackets, yeah. um, which I think is, you know, very important because he's not trying to get true to life. He's not trying to get exactly, you know, about uh, this is what being in the French resistance was like. This is what being in occupied France was like. Mm. Mm. He's talking about something a bit more uh, in abstract and he's trying to talk about several things at once. And to do that, he needs to do some blending he needs to put, you know, and that, that's what makes it, I think, really um, more real than if he would just made it a book about the French resistance. Yeah, um, yeah. Because then, not, I mean, you'd open yourself up to more criticism, I think, if you basically tried to do a history in a, a like, historic novel of something which happened, like, 10 years before, yeah. which you're a part of. And it, he wouldn't have been able to make the same philosophical points he wouldn't mm. have been able to demonstrate his points like in a literary way because it would have been all related to a history which we have so much knowledge of because it was so yeah. recent. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the, the aspect of the novel that I really uh, fucked with this time was just amazed at how well he was able to spin so many plates mm. and just keep them yeah. all so well balanced that you can read this from so many contexts where, you know, I don't even think he, you know, it's, he, he knew obviously he was writing about French occupation. He probably didn't think, I mean, obviously he knows that as he says, the plague can pop up anywhere. It's always dormant. And that's a true statement as well as being talking about, you know, the plague inside of all of us in terms of um, the tendency towards abstraction, the tendency not to engage in life, the tendency not to be, have compassion. Um, but, you know, I don't think that, you know, he would expect many people to be in a plague situation reading this and thinking about how good his account of a plague is. Mm. And yet because, I don't know, the occupation of a country by an invading army and lockdown is very similar in a lot of ways. There was so much that yes. just rang true about people's experiences of how people's reacted of, you know, the quadrant of the population, which was skeptical to all things and, you know, didn't oh, even yeah. believe in the plague, yeah. you know, so there's anti-vaxxers, there's uh, COVID is just a conspiracy to, you know, I don't know, do what? <laughs> like 5G. keep Trump out 5G, of office. Baby. Who the fuck no, knows? Yeah, yeah. The exactly. It's, it, it's Bill Gates as microchips. Yeah. It's, you know, who knows? But, you know, if you don't have a good theory, you're going to jump to a conspiracy theory. And mm. so I thought that was, you know, really interesting. And um, it led me to a, uh, it led me to think about, you know, obviously like the, the philosophy behind everything and, uh, and that blending which Camus was so concerned with of, of mm. these various layers 
and this you know i think there's a that there's a scene where rambert gets drunk and he kind of thinks he has the plague and he goes running mm-hmm. off into like the upper part of the town to try and find a, a a view unobstructed by buildings so that he can yell to his wife across the sea in france and like, yeah. say like rah just some moment of expostulation yeah and that Camus in that moment says you know that he finds a space when he gets to some square in the upper part of the town and he finds some space but he can't tell if it's sky or sea Mm. and he's all Camus always mixing blending the sky and the sea I think the imagery in in this book so well um and then there's a uh there's uh it reminded me of Camus wrote a forward to a uh a French translation of um, Oscar Wilde's The Ballad of Reading Jail and De Profundis yeah. and he called it The Artist in Prison where he mm. argues that uh, Wilde wasn't a great artist until he went to prison that you know Wilde mm. was this great aesthete and you know thought of himself as the artist and, and postulated about the artist and all these things but until he really encountered sorrow only then did he really understand what the artist was and did he become yeah. a great artist especially in De Profundis which is really just a letter um, and in the Ballad of Reading Jail. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> he said, you know, and so, you know, obviously I, I agree to that to some point. I, st- I still think the early essays and, and the plays are basically like by far the greatest plays in the whole Victorian era. So I think it's unfair to say he yeah, hadn't. The picture of he Dorian Gray he, is, yeah, very good. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a good thing, actually. I, I thought I was, because I know that you're also a fan of the picture of Dorian Gray, I just quote this. Um, this one thing that Camus says in this little forward, mm. he's talking about Wilde's late work. So kind of, you know, this is kind of like Baroque Wilde. Maybe he's not writing as well as he did when he was a bit younger. And he's kind of um, leading up to his imprisonment. His life's in a bit of a disarray. And Camus is mm, saying yep. that his late work wasn't very good. And he says this, All of his work of that time bears a sinister resemblance to the picture of Dorian Gray which developed wrinkles at a speed all the more alarming because the original appeared to remain young and attractive. (laughs) It's just such a sassy critique. (laughs) Um, There's probably something to it, to be fair, though. Yeah. But in that um, that, uh, essay, he also talks about wild um, as, you know, putting art above everything. And that Camus mm. disagrees with this idea and says, you know, art, art isn't about everything. Art is about blending. And mm. I think mm. that that, you know, part of Camus' philosophical kind of makeup is really demonstrated well in The Plague by how well he measures, you know, the allegory of the occupation, the allegory of the abstraction and the absurdism of, in, of his philosophy and then never actually sacrificing the plot, the characters. You know, it's all generous you know he's generous in every ass in every layer he is it's yeah. not like there's just one thin layer of you know it's like if you get a sandwich from a service station and it looks like there's a good mm. layer of cheese and stuff at the front and then you open the sandwich yeah. and there's just nothing in the back nothing at the back, <laughs> nothing no. in the back. camera is generous throughout the sandwich yeah. <laughs> i think that's what really he you does know it sang, very well yeah sang true to me this time is that mm. this the the novel does really well um so yeah i don't know did you were you most confronted by the actual plague layer, I guess, in, in having read it during the pandemic? Yeah, definitely. When, I, like, I, I'd read some Camus before this and I knew his background and I knew he wrote this in 1942, I think it is. So I, I could see clearly the, the allegory of the Nazi occupation, but it, it, it was frightening, the plague layer. Let's call it the plague layer. Um, it was frightening how true it was and how how starkly obvious it was to just to just be reading this and it's a book that's you know what 80 years old now and it was just getting so many things spot on the politics of the novel <clears throat> at the beginning like you said when he, when when Dr. Ryu's like I think this might be a plague and he's talking to the sort of the town politicians and they they they're debating what they should call it and he, he, yeah he says um oh I've got it here somewhere Explain before ta- t- uh, no, t- explain before talking. Yeah, so that's what I was just doing. That was my little note. Um, he, he's he's talking to the town politicians about the fact that this is a plague and it's killing people, 
and the, and they're talking about whether they should call it something else to not alarm people. And he mm-hmm. says, at this rate, if the disease is not halted, it could kill half the town within the next two months. Therefore, it doesn't matter if you call it the plague or growing pains. Mm-hmm. And th- there's more that he says after that, but just the politics involved and and it it's interesting being in a pandemic reading it because at the start of a pandemic to be skeptical is is kind of fair enough in a in a regard if you're not a doctor and you don't understand what's going on and you've obviously got a a country to manage or a a household a state whatever to be skeptical and think oh maybe it will pass you know maybe it is just a dead rat maybe it is just one sick person Mm-hmm. But I think reading it post the initial start of a pandemic when you're in the thick of it and you know it's not a joke anymore, to 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 be reading that scene is is very frustrating because you're like, ah, oh, just lock down now and you'll be sweet quickly and get on top of it. But obviously hindsight is is is, is key. But mm-hmm. I, I loved the politics of it. It was scarily true and that's sort of yeah. what i meant when i read the paragraph the the first paragraph when i said you know we if we don't learn from history we're doomed to repeat it and this was that was what was so evident to me is just yeah the truth in the novel in the plague mm-hmm. layer i think that's wonderful as well yeah and you get you know the, the, those dealings with the prefect and of the town and all these kind of administrative bodies and stuff you really get like dr fauci at his Senate hearing vibes. <laughs> if you've ever watched yeah. like Senator yeah. Rand Paul and Ron Paul, like remember his father's Ron Paul, Rand Paul, you know, debating him. And they're both doctors actually, but, um, and Dr. Fauci just being, oh my fucking God, just like have yeah. the common decency to not treat this like a matter of libertarianism, treat this as mm. a, a, a point of crisis and therefore you need to act a certain way. Um, yeah. And yeah, the frustration and, all those kind of aspects. And I think, you know, Dr. Ryu is, is a great character as well. The characters I think is where, you know, you have a plague and you have means you automatically have a stage. So plot mm. kind of takes care of itself because it's going to run a certain, yeah, it's going to run a certain way because, mm. but the characters I think is, is where Cammy really gets, does that work of blending, does that work of collage, which makes the plague work so well on, on so many levels and you know ryu is obviously got strong aspects of a lot of characters have strong aspects of camu and of other people but ryu is a great one because ryu is kind of this truth teller and he's the one who takes words very seriously and articulation very seriously and he's the kind of embodiment of the writer in mm. in camu's sense of the writer you know he's a philosopher He's a but it, in, in, and he's a novelist primarily. I think Camus is you know this kind of capital W writer. He kind of um, tries to tell the truth all the time, both to his own present tense and to the the wider mm. kind of. Mm. Uh, That's interesting. Philosophy of mm. you know the age. You know he's obviously in his present tense, but as you were saying before with uh, Pan Lu, you know um, Camus concerned like Nietzsche that the violence of the 19th and 20th century comes out of a, you know, the God being dead, the end of religion and yeah. this kind of vacuum, yeah. which takes place. And obviously the existentialists and Camus and Camus very determinedly wants to separate himself from the existentialists believes that, you know, you have to replace that transcendence with something. And for him, it's absurdity and rebellion mm. um, and providing, you know, a kind of rebellious form of reason to your life. And in, in uh, the rebel, he you know he talks about this kind of philosophy growing out of Baudelaire and dandyism and all these kind of things that you kind of have to be vibrant in the face of darkness, uh, and that uh, you know and Ryu is very much a character against who tries to tell things like it is, who isn't okay with abstractions, who isn't okay with you know these people saying like why can't we call it a virus why can't we call it a fever Mm. like do we have to call it the plague um and you know there's a there's a there's a scene where um i think rambert says you know will you do an interview and ryu says um are you able to publish exactly what i say uh and rambert says i'm not sure and he says, well, then there's mm. no point speaking. If I can't tell yeah. the exact truth, then there's no point speaking. If, if there's any limit, 
then, you know, it's this is obviously occupied France again. If I can't say, fuck off the Nazis, then am I really able to speak? Or am yeah. I just, yeah. you know, am I just uh, you know, hiding under the limitations set upon me by occupation or by uh, the occupation? Mm. So I think this is, you know, and a massive spoiler. So anyone listening, maybe close your ears or, or yeah. skip skip the next five seconds. But <laughs> for the whole uh, book, you don't know exactly who the narrator is. Uh, and yes. then it's revealed at the end that it is Ryu. He is the truth teller. Mm. He is the storyteller the whole time. Um, yep. And I think that's very, very telling. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. I... Uh, <laughs> I was, I was going to bring up something else, but no. Uh, I'll get to that eventually. It, it the, the humanism he captures in this novel was just... I, I just loved it because, like I said, I can just relate it exactly to everything that's going on at the moment. And not just the humanism, but like the, the removal of humanism and, and the fact that epidemics and, and pandemics and, and the plague, it, it makes you in exile within your own country, within your own community. Mm. You know, you you suddenly have people like stepping back from you when you when you sneeze, and that's so so prevalent. And even just this week, I was in lockdown because um, I was a close contact for someone with COVID, and my wonderful girlfriend brought me some groceries so I could live out the week. But of course, she didn't want to come like particularly close to me, and it 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 is this weird feeling of like, oh, I I'm like removed at the moment, and obviously. Mm-hmm you can rationalize it very easy. I could have been infected. She didn't want to get sick. It was a week. We survived. But in that moment, it was, it was this sort of like, I'm, I'm this exile in my own sort of place at the moment. And it's a very weird thing. And that's sort of very prevalent th- through the book. And he, he, he's just a master storyteller really. Mm. And, but then on the other hand, you had the humanism of the characters themselves. Um, the humanism of, of Dr. Ryu, you know, he's not, particularly a conventional hero he's not he's not saving the day in a way that a hero would when you say the the word hero he's doing it in the way that we now understand that the healthcare workers are the true heroes and everything like this like they put in these really long hours and there was this one quote that that really stuck out to me in the book and and it, it yeah I just it, it really vibed with me was this woman's criticizing Dr. Ryu for being in, in the latter half of the book he sort of, he gets a bit more cold and indifferent towards these deaths mm. because he just can't deal with it anymore and this woman says to him you have no heart oh she says it but it's a bit the tense is a bit sort of distorted because it's out of place you have no heart someone once told him but he did have one he used it to bear the 20 hours a day in which he saw men dying who were made for life he used it to start again day after day for the time being he had just enough heart for that mm. and <clears throat> he's not a hero you know if you think of a Hollywood hero they just seem to be able to you know the James Bond they can just always turn up and they're always apathetic mm. to everything and then can just keep going whereas Dr. Ryu is like struggling he's seeing death every day he's seeing all these wonderful people dying mm. and he, he doesn't have time to grieve because if he starts grieving and if he starts realising that these people are actually dying. He'll probably break down himself. And mm. I just love the fact that Camus understood that about people. It's, it's, they can't go on all the time. They can't, they eventually succumb to pressure in the way that Dr. Ryu's trying to stave off this pressure just to, just to do this job to try help the, the, the wider range of population. You know, he's, he's sacrificing his own sort of emotional state and, I guess respect for the dead who those people are dead but it's for the broader sort of community at that moment so yeah i thought his his humanism throughout the book is just stunning very beautiful yeah that's such a um i mean i'm, I'm glad you i'm glad you brought up the uh the concept of and the theme of exile which i think is mm. massive in the book and that's um what i uh what I am probably what what I was first attracted to in Camus was this sense. Mm. I think Camus always felt like an exile. You know, he was a Pied Noir, a, a kind of French descendant in Algeria, so he never felt completely Algerian. And then in France, mm. he wasn't completely French, and uh, and I think always 
yeah, struggle with that independence that he was kind of forced to inhabit. Uh, and I always felt very drawn to that very, uh, you know, I felt like he, a, th- a thrill of recognition in that sense. Mm, mm. And that, you know, he really gets to this point um, and talks about this very powerfully in the book. But I also think that just coming back to the, the that heroism that, you know, displayed by Ryu and displayed by Taru and, you know, the guys who formed the volunteer party, ostensibly mm, the mm. French resistance, you know, people who are trying to do something, um, you know, to, to, to help. Um, but yeah, obviously. And then, you know, he's somewhat inured to the monotonous death around him mm. and inured to suffering and, you know, he's at that point of not having hope and, and, and people aren't compassionate. People aren't seeing him for his struggle. They're just saying that, hell, oh, he doesn't care. He's just, you know, uh, this chick's got plague. She's dead, whatever, move on. Yeah. Um, you know, he's just trying to do the best he can with the limited resources he has. And it comes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, he has this talk, I think, I think it was with Taru I and mean, about heroism, and he says, you know, it's not about heroism; it's about common decency and just doing what mm. you can. Mm. And yeah. this is what I can do. Um, and there is a, you know, it's a, it's once again dealing with that sense of hopelessness of there not being transcendence. I think, which is a big part of you know what the plague and something as catastrophic and monotonously catastrophic as the plague or as war um, shows people and, you know, really happened in those centuries, uh, you know, how could there be a Mm. God if the gas chambers happened? How could there be? Yeah. And, you know, this isn't particularly, um, you know, there's a line of Sylvia Plath, where she says, uh, you know, I looked at the skies, but they were empty. Mm. And um, there's, there's a, it reminds me of a, a thing, um, a quote that Camo used, used, uses a lot to talk about this idea of um, there being a kind of absence that you have to fill in with your own meaning that Ryu is doing. He's putting his own meaning into, you know, his own meaning of collectivity and decency into his life, even though he knows he's fighting against a kind of just indifferent nature. Yeah. yeah. And the line from Stendhal is, uh, uh, how does it go? Um, the only excuse for God is that he doesn't exist, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which I always found to be a very powerful line. You know, if there is a God, then he has a lot to answer for. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Obviously, and you, you see that in the scene where the child dies of the the young boy, the prefect's son mm. dies of, of yeah. a very very painful death, um, and you know how could there be a god? And and the priest is there, um, Penlu Penlu is there, and he's <laughs> trying to square off his uh, kind of you know theological ideas about you know god and how he inhabits the world and all these kind of things and he can't really he's he's whipping himself into all sorts of tangles to try and make his yeah yeah ideas Um, play he's testing us this is yeah this is yeah god testing us in our and our faith right now yeah come on no and it's just brutal but you know this is a um as as i was reading that there's um I don't know, there's a painting in the Louvre by Delacroix called An Orphan Girl at the Cemetery. Mm. I think it's like an early study for a later painting he was going to do. But it's like a masterpiece in its own right, very well known. And it's kind of, I always thought it was interesting because it's before Delacroix went to Morocco and where he kind of acquired all that colour that he's so famous for. Mm. But you can still get that sense of colour in this, even though it's like a kind of a, a girl, a despondent girl in a cemetery under grey skies and... He somehow makes the greys and the kind of winter browns and everything. He makes them vibrant despite the hopelessness of the picture. And this girl is kind of looking up towards off into the sky. And, you know, the uh, 
critics, I think, or it even might have been in that Julian Barnes essay that we talked about in an earlier episode. Mm. You know, he he talks about critics saying that there's a there's a prayer on her mouth, there's a prayer on her lips that she's about to, you know, reach up to you know she's reaching to the sky in a prayer. She, you know, she's got nothing, um, but the skies are empty. <laughs> I love the Sylvia Plath line. But when I look at this, when I look at that painting, I kind of feel that she's looking up and as if someone's arriving, as if someone's coming to to join her or to, you know, some relative, some friend, someone's mm. going to give her another chance, a place to go, something to do in life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that you, you kind of always have to have that sense of hope, you know, even mm. without, even if the skies are empty. In, in humans yeah. coming along, in, in someone coming along to help you. Yeah. And that, you know, the skies are empty, but Ryu is there putting in 22 hours a day. The skies are empty, yeah. but people are going to form a volunteer squad and try and do their best. The skies are empty, but there's people at Oxford making vaccines. You know, there's, um, you know, there's, there is meaning to be found if you look for it. And if you, if you don't get on such a high horse that, uh, there's no point in all this, like nature is, brutish and short and and all this kind of stuff so i think yeah that that's a really great humanistic part of you know the, the, what the characters get across and and what camera mm. is trying to get across in the thing in, in the book um yeah but yeah, ex- 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 just, ex- yeah sorry just just going on that exact point that you, you're waiting for someone to come across i think that's very well and very easy to say that that's displayed in the character of um, Rambert, Rambert mm. because he's he's contacted the underground people and he's going to flee the town illegally mm. to get to his wife in Paris and then he sort of gets to the gates and he sort of has this moment of like I can't do this I, there's mm. just too much guilt here so then he returns and then he starts helping and yeah becomes a team player mm-hmm yeah, he says, you know, I, I couldn't live with myself if I did leave everyone in the lurch because I've, I like you people. I've connected with you people. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 and yeah, that's yeah. It's just an, another really richly textured uh, layer in this in in the book. And just to go back to exile, because I think you know, exile is obviously a point, a very personal um, feeling that I always have. Exile is always a sense of life that I. Um, seem to uh recognize or or truck with and there's a line i think quite early on where he starts to to build up this idea of you know he's talking about the separation of people from their loved ones isolation lockdown uh, all these kind of things and he, he, he encapsulates all of these uh you know tempestuous emotions and sufferings into the idea of being a prisoner in an exile mm-hmm even if you're not quite behind bars, but, um, and he's, and the quote is thus too, they came to know the incorrigible sorrow of all prisoners and exiles, which is to live in company with a memory that serves no purpose. Even the past of which they thought incessantly had a savor only of regret for they would have wished to add it all, wished to it all, wished to it all that they regretted having left undone while they might yet have done it with the man or woman whose return they now awaited. Just as in all the activities, even the relatively happy ones, of their life as prisoners, they kept vainly trying to include the absent one, and thus there was always something missing in their lives. Hostile to the past, impatient of the present, and cheated of the future, we were much like those whom men's justice or hatred forces to live behind prison bars. And I think especially that idea of... um, I love that kind of definition of being in exile, of being in pris- being a prisoner, which is to live in company with a memory that serves no purpose. In yeah. the, you know, in my experience, you know, you kind of live with a memory of your homeland, or you know, a past, or a, you know, a narrative of your life which has been cut off, and you can no longer add to, you can no longer invest in, um, and that you feel you're isolated in some yes lockdown, uh, but also if you're forced into exile for political reasons, for personal reasons, whatever it is, you're kind of cut off from your own story and you have to just live in this kind of makeshift cell of a new life, which is, Mm, mm. you know, you can make the best of it, but 
you know, you all you always live with a sense of unfinishedness. You always live with that. There's something missing because you weren't able to. You know, a part of yourself is back somewhere. You know, lost adrift. Um, yeah, like floats yeah. them from yeah, the yeah, ship, yeah. and um, and you know, as uh, you know, we're after two years in lockdown. The other day, I finally, as you know, I finally was able to book tickets, and I'm going to come visit Ooh. Australia. Going to come visit you, yeah. and and family, and my you know native shores. And my partner, mm. Samira, got a visa. And hopefully it's not a whole Novak Djokovic situation. <laughs> as I said before, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, hopefully not. You know, we're all fully vaccinated and everything. But it's, uh, you know, Australia's obviously likes to keep a tight, tight little secluded island thing going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, for the same reasons, I guess, of what, you know, Iran cutting itself off uh, and mm. people cutting off Iran. But... Yeah, after kind of, yeah, I, I did have a new sense of the uh, power of the closing scenes where everyone is kind of having their um, their reunions and their, mm. the feelings of kind of exhaustion uh, turning into ecstasy and, um, mm. you know, disbelief of... Wow, is 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 something is change finally come? Is yeah, you know, I had become so inured to this. I'd become so uh, I don't know, um, succumbed to the cell of this life uh, that yeah. we have been locked in for all this time, and now mm. you know I've become so inured to <laughs> kind of the loneliness and the destitution of of Berlin and lockdown, and you know, in I mean, I already felt that. So lockdown for me was kind of. Like, oh, now everyone else feels like I do. So that kind of actually made me comfortable. I felt less guilty because before, you know, I felt like I have to have a social life and force myself yeah, to go out and yeah. do things when really I just wanted to be at home working, <laughs> writing yeah. and doing things. And then when mm-hmm. that, when everyone was in that situation, I felt, oh, I don't have, to, I don't have any social obligations. I don't have to feel mm. guilt or shame about that. So I can just get on with what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I actually, you know, it's been really productive for me, but at the same time, we've been in lockdown for like two years, basically. Um, Mm. Or at least I have, you know, things have opened up and then they closed again and then they opened up again. But, uh, you know, more or less, you don't do too much. Don't go to bars. I've probably been in like a social situation with more than three people, maybe two or three times in the last two years. Mm. So so very small life, very uh, isolated, um, you know, and other people you know bring a lot of anxiety with them and i'm like whoa get away from me like i don't like this <laughs> you know yeah but also the, the, that, that temptation and that uh you know wanting to um you know have all these reunions builds up builds up builds up and you're so excited mm. for it um and so in those kind of final scenes uh you know that was much more euphoric i think for me this time than it was the first time because the first time I you know I could imagine that but yeah. I was also like you know that's never going to happen I'm kind of gone for good <laughs> I, I never want to go back to that place I never yep. want yeah the idea of reunion wasn't even possible it was that the idea of reunion was a nightmare to me before <laughs> now it yeah it's yeah. got it's it's got a nice tinge to it so um yeah I think that was also a really a, a lovely uh kind of thing which I got to enjoy this time yeah yeah definitely and for those eagle-eyed readers listeners out there there is a little little joke among this story i think you caught it blake because I, we have spoken about it before but i've got the penguin classics version so it's on page 43 i'll read the quote and you know, oh i think i know what you're gonna say yeah. um so yeah, this is the quote she had spoken of a recent arrest that caused a stir in Algiers. It involved a young company employee who had killed an Arab on a beach. Yeah. So it's a nice yeah. little bit of, you know. Very meta. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is which is a bit of fun. Good to know he he had a little smile on his face when, when yeah. writing that line, I'm sure. Because it yeah, is quite a depressing story. Yeah, but there is a bit of humour. I mean, Camus does have mm. humour. Like I said, you know, with that little quip in his critique of wild, he has a very sassy side. Um, mm. 
there, there, I think there's two or three also little sections in the plague where he'll personify a character, I think, the prefect's wife as being mousy. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, you know, and then he talks about, um, you know, and then she'll say something. And instead of saying like, you know, said the wife or said whatever her name was, he goes, said the mouse. Yeah, and there's another one where he describes someone as horse faced, and then mm. when they say something, he goes, "said the horse." Yeah, and uh, so he, I don't know. He 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 does. There's a bit of play. He sometimes does let himself play and make little jokes, um, which I think is really, I don't know. You you, I, you never expect it, and then you're like, oh, okay, hold on, let me just readjust how I'm hearing yeah. this 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 voice in my head because mm. there is a you know he can be ironic he can you know he's not just relating this dark old story there is um you know there, there's a person relating this story there's a person who's yeah. going to play with their language as they talk about it and of mm. course the language mm. is so rich and vibrant that you're aware of that already but when someone introduces a bit of humor even if it's just a kind of silly humor like that where you know it turns people into little animals in a animals, through yeah. through description um. yeah I don't know that's good and I think there's another really meta I'm trying to think of a another because there's one with the stranger and I think there's another one which I was going to bring up but now I can't quite um, where maybe I have no I, maybe, I, maybe I don't have it but um, actually that was something I was uh, I thought I'd bring up as well there was the scene where uh one of the bars says, you know, the best protection against the plague is a bottle of wine as an mm. advertising campaign. And then he says, you know, that which uh, which really uh, trucked along with the prevalent rumor that alcohol could keep the plague at bay. Yeah. And I remember, I don't know if it happened in Australia, I think it always did, uh, but there was, you know, a rumor that alcohol was, was a good deterrent for COVID-19, I think, at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm. Well, yeah. you, know, you see like those news stories going around as if people are just trying to hopefully put that out there because yeah. they're drinking to and they want to justify their alcoholism. Yeah. But I also read um, <laughs> an article two days ago or something that the University of Oregon has been doing all these tests and that cannabis actually does uh, stop the spread of the virus oh, in human yeah, cells. Oh, yeah, I saw that, yeah. You see that? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So basically what we need to do is hotbox the planet not good, for <laughs> not good for climate change, but just do one hot boxing. Everyone just get everyone high, and I mean, you don't even have to do it. You can just do it with CBD. You don't even need to do have THC. It's just mm-hmm. you just need the cell type. And apparently, it, it like it's basically like putting, um, you know, the 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 COVID nineteen protein just can't stick to the cells if there's yeah right the CBD yeah. you know so mm. it's. I don't know, pretty amazing discovery if they can basically just make an organic pill which yeah. could deter, which basically just a CBD pill. Well, then, deter. yeah, all the anti-vaxxers are probably in the clear then. Yeah, just everyone all just... All up in Nimbin, Byron Bay, they're probably, they're all, they're all high all the time anyway, so they're yeah. probably more protected than us. Good for them. Yeah, oh, I don't know, I don't see Australia moving towards legalization. That's probably the only thing I'm I'm, st- I'm still very political about. <laughs> In Germany, uh Germany's legalizing. The new government is uh oh. legalizing marijuana. It's going to be the biggest uh marijuana market in in Europe. So, damn. That's going to be pretty interesting. I don't I don't know how long it'll take to get set up, but yeah. I think it's already happening. So that's yeah pretty interesting but i don't see australia doing it for a long time i think they just recently turned down another medical marijuana i um, think they did yeah things so i mean australia is just such a backward conservative place and things like this you know they'll readily drink and get into fights every five seconds but just oh my god a giant you must be a fucking hippie (laughs) yep Yep. correct amundo but there was lots of those yeah. kind of things which are, you know, reading it, rereading it. I was like, oh, I remember that bit of the COVID-19 and it was in yeah. the plague, you know. I remember that bit. Yeah. I remember when everyone was like that. I remember this, you know, that kind of reaction to isolation. I remember how this person, um, mm. you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it was very layered. And, yeah, I don't know. I think it was, 
I, you know, when you suggested re- doing the plague, I think I was a bit like, oh mm-hmm. God, this thing has gone on Hesitant, for so long. Yes. I'm already so <laughs> over this. Um, uh, you know, and when everyone, you know, when the COVID-19 happened, I was like, oh, I should probably I should reread the plague because it's opposite. But top the idea just seemed like, oh, I don't know, I'm in it now and I've read it before. I'd rather escape rather than yeah, yeah. dive in. But I'm glad you did. Glad you... Um, brought me back to it because it's been I don't know a great read and Mm. yeah I think that um, you know I really I had a uh, rereading is such a powerful experience because Mm. you get a sense of your own change you get a sense of how you've reinterpreting you get a sense of what's constant you get a sense of what you still believe in, what you don't believe in, what's still important to you, what's not. You notice new mm-hmm. things. You've, you you yeah. don't notice the things which seem so important to you maybe on the first time didn't strike you as being that much mm-hmm. uh, yeah. that much to worry about. Um, and, you know, I don't... I guess I'm just so voracious and, uh, you know, and I'm so... Oh, I want to read this new thing and there's so much I haven't read that yeah. I often yeah. forget to go back and reread. Um, yeah, because uh, you watch a movie two three four times music listen to on repeat all day but books yeah you don't you don't often my girlfriend just say ask you know how many books do you reread and i said Ooh. not many if they're on the the retirement list i've got my retirement list of books i'm definitely going to read again yeah but other than that are there any ever. that you consistently reread probably the little prince mm. because that's very easy Mm-hmm. Uh, Lord of the Rings I think I've what read twice and listened to twice mm-hmm. um, that's probably it mm-hmm. really for rereading I, there's definitely books I know in my mind I definitely want to read them again yeah Count of Monte Cristo Moby Dick um, I think I've read The Great Gatsby twice actually two or three times even so. yeah yeah what about you but pretty similar, I think. I've read... There was a period, maybe like five or six years, where I read Giovanni's Room, like mm. kind of f- five I or six times. I read that again, yeah. And uh, there's definitely a lot of essays and stuff. I mean, when it comes to Camus, I've read Summer in Algiers, Return to Tiapasa, mm. all of the... Um... Myth of Sisyphus. No, I haven't read... I mean, I've, no, I, mean, I probably have read that a couple of times, but... Mm. You know, one of the things I'm also most attracted to about Camus is his kind of eternal sunshine, his eternal Algerian sunshine, yeah. which in the sea close by and and the and the lyrical essays and you know summer in Algiers are just the most evocative, beautiful, lyrically beautiful yeah, essays, and I go back to them say. Yeah. routinely. Um, mm. So lots of that kind of stuff. I definitely yeah. listen and read PG Woodhouse a lot. Um, oh. I you should mention it. Oh yeah, yeah. Why are you? Uh, well, it, why? Why it, is that funny? It might come <laughs> up in a few minutes in the podcast. Oh, okay. Interesting. 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 Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's. Yeah, I mean, lots of things. Uh, like you, I definitely. I'm um, looking forward to a few rereadings. I, I, I have read Gatsby mm. a few times. Sometimes I go back. There was a period where I went back and read. Um, uh, particular scenes of of Gatsby just to to kind of work try and work out how Fitzgerald did it. Yeah. Um, Fitzgerald's one of those writers for me where you read and you think I could I could write this scene, <laughs> and then you know you, you know what happens. Uh, you know, for instance, like the scene where they're having the party and it leads up to where um, what's his face slaps. Uh, slaps daisy i can't remember no not daisy the the oh tom slaps um tom slaps his mistress his mistress Um, yeah i mean i haven't read it in a while now but that scene particularly you know there's such a build-up to that to that section um Mm -hmm. you think yeah i could write this i know what happens and then you you kind of start out and then you look back at fitzgerald and you're like whoa okay no 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 i like it's kind of it's 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 like a play of light it's like mm. a mirage. Like you can't quite grasp it. He is always somehow 
there's some elusive description or word in every kind of sentence which mm. you miss and if you miss you lose all magic it's uh i don't know this cheryl's just this the the technical skill he, uh, of and just the kind of genius he has in that book particularly i don't know it's always worth going back and rereading because there's always something new and i think that's you know very excited to read moby dick we'll definitely do a deep dive on moby dick one episode yes uh, and um yeah i think there's quite a few other books that i'd like to reread and i'm looking forward to reread but i don't know i'm still quite transfixed by just there's so much i haven't read and yeah, that I want yeah. to read. Um, well, that's why I've called it the retirement list. Because yeah. I want to spend my life reading, and then when I retire, I've got a nice little list of books that I know are good to go back and reread. Yeah. I mean, we're roughly the same age, so I say, like, if this podcast is still going when we're about 60, we'll change it <laughs> from on the same page to retirement rereading, and, yeah. and then we'll just go back <laughs> and start rereading and seeing how we've changed. One episode a week till we're, s- till we're 80. That's 50, what, 50 times 5? That's oh God, I can't do maths. Let's not even bother. Yeah, but you can be at your kind of like 75 school year reunion and people will be like, I'm listening to your podcast, that's right. Yeah, wouldn't that be wild? Yeah, God. Oh. Well, speaking of, I mean, uh, we've, I mean, there's so much to talk about in the plague still, but we can't go on forever. Any uh, no. other things that you thought we should mention? Uh, I've got one more quote, very, very simple um it's just uh this is why everyone appears tired because nowadays everyone is a little infected and i thought that's just a lovely way of summing it up because right now i think everyone just is that they're, they're just tired mm-hmm. in this COVID 19 they're just they're just exhausted it's just it's beating them down even though we're spending more time at home and you know most people are working from home it's just it's it's tiring mm-hmm. doing less just suddenly becomes this burden of ugh. So yeah, I really liked that line. I thought that sort of summed up society yeah. well. I know I'm completely burnt out entirely, and yeah, nothing seems to be quite changing in this mm. period. You know, there's yeah a real sense of um, I think boredom as well in in Camus' philosophy is very important because he equates boredom with kind of. Uh, I don't know, complicity of giving up of uh, mm. hopelessness and um, that boredom is, you know, the kind of thing which you have to react against and rebel against and not let boredom yeah. um, dull your senses, dull your sensibilities, not to let something like abstract plague or anything make you believe that there can't be change. You know, you've got to believe that a change is going to come, that yeah. you have to find what interests you, your passions and, and try and, work them into some kind of tool i don't know at least that's how i'm seeing it at the moment because Mm, yeah mm. change is so hard to come by and good thing you're coming to australia yeah although i know this might this might be up your alley last night i was uh you know very bored and i kind of yeah a lot of the projects i've been working on have kind of stalled or or have you know kind of fallen limp into the sea like Icarus so 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 I'm kind of a bit sullen and uh and I was looking to for something to watch and I couldn't really find anything I feel like everything I don't really have many of the streaming services I kind of hack onto your Disney account every so often but (laughs) most of the stuff on there is pretty crap or you know maybe I'm just not finding much interest in things um my partner Samir and I recently watched the first episode of 24 because we thought like an action show would, you know, stop you from thinking about, you know, what's going on and it's just an easy thing to get lost in. Um, but it was just terrible. And <laughs> I feel like every show I watch is terrible. I know we're both Star yeah. Wars fans. Book of Boba Fett is terrible in my opinion. Yep. So I'm just like, oh, every time I even try to escape my condition. I'm confronted with more boredom because the stuff I'm watching is so bad. And yeah. so I guess that's another reason why I'm glad I have this podcast and that I can, mm. that I have something keeping me reading and keeping me uh, thinking about the stuff I'm actually interested keeping in. Cause active. otherwise I, 
yeah might be lost and last night i was so bored i couldn't find anything and i was like oh but i eventually realized that there are uh, all the seasons of poirot are on youtube and so i watched a couple of episodes <laughs> <Yes>. of poirot <laughs> i watched uh, so uh good. with david suchet with david suchet and i watched uh oh, the one so good uh trouble at sea where there is they're on this beautiful old yacht this it's called i, I looked it up it's called uh Madiz, um mm. and the, the yacht they used for this thing and it's like 118 years old now uh beautiful yacht and there's a there's a murderer aboard and uh, there's always a murderer turns out the guy was a ventriloquist but <laughs> there's always <laughs> always something like that <laughs> yeah but uh um, yeah anyway so that uh that's what i've been up to recently but anyway what are you reading this week let, let it, maybe you alluded um, to earlier <laughs> pg woodhouse i started reading um the jeeves collection oh yes <laughs> so i found it it's on audible it was free um it's just it's just called the jeeves collection volume one and it's like 40 hours of 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 Jeeves. Oh, um, yeah. It's read by um, Stephen Fry. So oh, the Fry a, one, yeah. Tick. Yeah. So I've listened to the first three. I don't really get them. I don't know if they're like chapters of a bigger story or if they're all just individual little short stories, but it's 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 so far just giving me the same vibes as like listening to Sherlock because Stephen Fry yeah. does that. And then it's just so lovely to, to just be read to by Stephen Fry and and it's a fun little witty story so far i mean the first one was about um he's interested in a girl and jeeves is sort of dating this girl that wait i I don't even know the character's names this is how fresh it is who's jeeves jeeves is is he's not a butler. butler he's a gentleman's valet yeah a gentleman's personal gentleman as woodhouse calls it <laughs> a valet is not a butler a valet is a kind of jack of all trades they they have mm. their hand in everything there's nothing they can't solve nothing they can't get for you there's nothing they no one they don't know they have yeah and jeeves is this um omnipotent uh, omniscient force in the books which yeah. uh every problem you know they are all short stories i guess in a way uh, mm. episodic you know serialized stories um they do loosely entwine obviously because the characters are there and and yeah know, yeah more or less the general gist is that bertie will get forced into some kind of engagement with someone he doesn't want to be engaged with by his rich auntie agatha who gives him his money <laughs> yes. and you know you have to get married you have to get married and he's he wants to stay an eternal bachelor and so he gets always uh he has to become engaged to all these mental people or uh, not always mental but people he doesn't like and yeah. he always just gets into mischievous ways to get out of it or he gets caught in the middle of things uh and jeeves is always the force which uh which brings the solution in the end so he's kind of the, the poirot yeah yeah um yeah yeah so so far loving it i've only got two or three in but plenty to go which is good because yeah jesus he's a lot of fun he's a bit sassy but very straightforward and yeah. stephen fry is a master stephen fry is a master i haven't listened to the fry ones i listened to i can't remember who i think i talked about it in our audiobooks episode i listened to recently re uh the uh i can't remember what his name is but the, the narrator had a very similar voice for the characters that i already had in my head so that just fit perfectly okay, that's good yeah. one of the best times okay. in probably lockdown was you know, I'll go for walks for like four hours <laughs> because I would just not yeah. want to go back. Yeah. I just want to keep listening to to this because yeah, it's just funny and, and I don't know. I, I just I just love that um, ridiculous uh, schoolboy system at uh, in the seriousness of life. You know, it's all grown up, but Bertie still treats everything with a reverence, and it's all just innocence. Mm. You know, I think Auden called P.G. Woodhouse England's Eden, where it's, uh, mm. you know, everything is innocence. And, yeah. you know, innocence is, is, you know, a big vice, I think. You know, one of the big aspects of the plague is that all malevolence and evil comes out of ignorance. Um, yeah. And, you know, and... But, you know, when it's true, there is a loveliness of innocence when it is truly innocent, which I think is what P.G. Mm. Woodhouse gets into. This real lovely childish play... Um, and then he sets it on the stages of 
English high society. So it's, you know, aristocrats yeah. and all these people who have power and who are involved in diplomacy and all this kind of stuff. And he's showing how silly it all is and and how, um, I don't know, funny it all is. And I just love all the language. Hello, old Kubo. Hello, old chap. You know, good <laughs> and, and it's just, you yeah. know, it's just stupid and hilarious. And there's so many, um, I don't know, witty sayings. And he's always weaving in Shakespeare and other mm -hmm. literary mm -hmm. devices. And um, yeah, so I'm glad you're enjoying that. This week, yeah. I am listening to something as well. I mm -hmm. uh, am on the audiobook train. And I have been listening to The Typhoon by Joseph Conrad. Oh, you, okay. Do you know this one? I haven't. Re I haven't read it or listened to it. Um, is it any good? Very good. It's a novella. Uh, it's mm. pretty simple. You just have a kind of again this innocently minded sea captain who's kind of so innocent mm. that he doesn't even understand anything. He doesn't even understand the use of imagery in language or something like that. He says, yeah. um, you know, like one of the other characters says, like. Oh, you know, like this weather's so bad, it would make a saint swear. And the captain, mm. who's this kind of uh, Belfast guy, um, you know, why would a saint swear? I just don't get it. Why don't you talk normally? <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's a terrible Northern Irish accent. Why would a saint swear? Why wouldn't he just speak normally? <laughs> Something like that. And, um, <laughs> you know, he, he has no concept. He's just so innocent minded, he doesn't understand anything. And he kind of just doesn't even feel things. And the whole, there's this, it's quite a humorous, even basically the whole book, you have an opening gambit where there's this obstinate captain, um, doesn't, you know, doesn't believe in reading books, doesn't believe you can find anything about how to maneuver around bad weather. He's a sea captain in the South China Sea on a, on a kind of a, a steamer. And this typhoon comes along and you know people are like i think you should uh get the fuck out of the way of this typhoon and he's like uh that's bullshit you can't outmaneuver wind like you know <laughs> whatever they say in books you've just got to run through it um yep. and so he put and there's all these uh you know what they call cool these chinamen uh who are part of who are, who are on board and he locks them all downstairs which is pretty fucked up and they they go through the whole journey like locked in the downstairs cabins while mm. uh the crew fucking like get washed overboard and they're hanging on to things and the whole book you're in typhoon and, he, and conrad's amazing at describing it you know obviously he was a mm. sea captain himself and um and yeah it's fabulous and you just get this you know high drama and people are hanging off boats and stuff and and dying getting washed overboard and and still the sea captain's like nasty weather isn't it nasty weather <laughs> you've got to with accents I, I need to have just some kind of phrase to get me into it and for northern irish i think it's uh ginger and community or i try and picture uh brendan rogers who used to manage liverpool and he used to always say uh you know they could lose like five one he'd be like yeah, but I think the boys put in a good effort today. <laughs> you like, you lost five one. <laughs> but yeah, I haven't quite finished it yet. But the typhoon mm. is great novella. I re yeah, really good. I mean, comrades, yeah. comrades, a master. So yeah, and I really, um, yeah, that's pretty I'll good action. Well. Yeah, free on plus yeah, as well. Free. So yeah. nice one. That's, that's Thank what you. I love. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that has been the plague, and I'm glad that our COVID separation. I don't know if I think we'll just keep the on the same page title and intro once we're yeah. actually doing our podcast face to face. I think so. Yeah. Pending my actual getting on the flight, of course. If I get of Omicron, course. fingers I could are get crossed. Things are. Don't quite... even say it. Yeah, not going to jinx it yet, but yeah, a change could be on the horizon and hopefully that isn't a typhoon <laughs> nice yeah <laughs> thanks for tuning in guys that was the plague cheers cheers guys Uru.